Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> all right, I mean, it's three, right? I get it. We all ate. Some of us drank. It's a little tired time, but we're going to pump it up. We have a great panel that we're going to do right now. I am Brendan Reichs. I'm the author of the New York Times bestselling Nemesis series, which includes Nemesis, Genesis, and Chrysalis, which comes out March 5th, 2019. And I'm also releasing a new middle grade series called The Dark Deep with the great Ali Condi, and it will release October 2nd of this year. So that's all I'm going to talk about myself. If you want to hear more about me, and I'm sure you do, come see me tomorrow <laughs> at the We Read YA panel, which is at noonish on Sunday, or perhaps 1. I believe it's noon. We'll work on that. OK. We have an amazing panel lined up for you today, and it's titled The Thrill of the Chase, Pursuing the Truth, which is an exceptionally long title that says almost nothing at the same time. So we're going to ask a little bit questions about mysteries, thrillers, and suspense, and then if that gets boring, we'll go off to more interesting topics. Um, I, this is how it's going to work. I'm going to introduce everyone uh, individually, and then they're going to each tell us a little bit about what they're working on now, and then I will ask the panel some as I like to describe, hopefully not terrible questions. Then we're going to do some audience questions, and then we're going to close with a lightning round. So be prepared for that. We'll talk about that at the end. Uh, does that sound good? Sounds great. All right. Now, this panel is, oh, signing directly to follow, which starts at 4.30 PM in the sales auditorium. And that is at row nine. And it's not an auditorium. It's a pavilion, it turns out. So come see us right afterwards. Everyone here, including myself, will be signing books then. Uh, this panel is generally about how these writers put together tightly plotted thrillers, mysteries, and stories that send their readers on a search for truth while scaring the crap out of them. Uh, so that sounds pretty good. And they employ shock surprises and general cleverness. And we're going to de delve into that today. Uh, but first, we're going to meet our panelists. And I'm going to start right here with the number one New York Times bestselling author of the Legend series, the Young Elite series, Batman Nightwalker, Warcross, and its hotly anticipated sequel, Wild Card displayed here, which releases this September. Do I have that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some may not know that Marie is also a very talented artist and illustrated the last two volumes of the Illuminae series by Jay Kristoff and Amy Kaufman. Marie was also a video game artist in a former incarnation and now lives in LA as an Assassin's Creed expert and operates a low-level dog boarding home. Ladies and gentlemen, Marie Lou. <laughs> Thanks, Brendan. You guys didn't sit in order. OK. <laughs> Author of the piping hot debut novel Dive Smack, a psychological teen thriller about a tragic house fire and the protagonist's possible role in starting it, Demetra was already an award-winning art director and designer and a quasi-museum -mu curator. Can I get away with that? Yep. Is that fair? And a replacement tooth maker in dental labs, which is super creepy. Um, <laughs> She has a dog named Pony Boy and a weird thing about a monarch butterfly that I do not understand. So ladies and gentlemen, Dimitra Brodsky. <laughs> All right. He's a New York Times bestselling author of Meddling Kids and the Supernatural Enhancements in the forthcoming novel, This Body's Not Big Enough for the Both of Us, releasing next week, if I have that right. Well, that's congratulations on that. Uh, Edgar is also a cartoonist and works in C Catalan and Spanish as well as English and has given his hometown, hopefully he's a huge, are you a Messi Barcelona fan? No, not absolutely. Oh, no. Well, that's a disaster. I won't hold it against you. Ladies and gentlemen, Edgar Quintero. And the number one New York Times bestselling author of Stalking Jack the Ripper and Hunting Prince Dracula, as well as the huge forthcoming release, Escaping from Houdini, which arrives in September. Uh, Carrie also claims to have grown up in a haunted house, uh, which explains her gothic obsession, and likes to cook and guzzle tea with her cats, and has a food blog? I want to hear more about the food blog in a minute. She apparently also still enjoys handwritten letters, which is weird and totally wrong. Ladies and gentlemen, Carrie Maniscalco. Uh, he's a best-selling author of the historical thriller series, The Scotland Yard Murder Squad, which includes The Yard, The Black Country, The Devil's Workshop, and a new novel entitled The Saints of Wolves and Butchers, a contemporary thriller that tackles white nationalism in the heartland. That's a pretty quick summary, but is that a fair assessment of the book? That? That's a, that's a sm short summary, but uh, I think... Short, but yeah. <laughs> Alex also writes comic books, short stories, and anthology works. He's a former ad executive, so we understand that he's been suffering through much of his life. Ladies and gentlemen, Alex Grecian. <laughs> Do we have anybody else on the panel? I don't know. That was it. Well, 
Walter. Walter. <laughs> I know, I can't find his. What are, there you go, you're hiding. He's the author of the highly anticipated debut novel, Breach, which releases on November 6th. Breach combines World War, World, ah, Cold War espionage with magic and general awesomeness. He also designs software and teaches fencing and doesn't have a large footprint online to mine where, when you're putting together intros. Uh, so that also includes his first name, which I've just learned is Walter, uh, if that is your name, because you're probably a spy. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, W.L. Goodwater, allegedly Walter. <laughs> All right, we're now going to go down the road exactly one time in this panel. And from then on, I want everybody to jump in when you have an answer and mix it up. Uh, not everybody has to answer everything, but we'd love to hear from everybody the same amount. Uh, so tell us exactly what it was that your current project is and what brought you to Comic-Con. And please start, Marie. Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Marie. And my current project is a duology called Warcross. This is um, very near future science fiction. It's pretty much happening today, um, except that there's this game called Warcross that's kind of taken the world by storm. It's a combination of like augmented reality and virtual reality. Um, I used to work in games, so I knew I always wanted to write something like that. Um, and it's, it's a book about a girl who's a bounty hunter who's kind of down on her luck, and she hacks into this game, catches the attention of the creator of the game, um, and gets hired to track down a hacker that's ruining the game. Um, so that's what I'm working on right now, and that's what I'm at Comic-Con for. Um, my project right now is Dive Smack. It's about a springboard diver who looks into his family's past um, with a history project at school and starts to uncover some secrets that should have stayed buried. And I chose to make him a springboard diver because I have a friend who was in the 1992 Olympics, and um, I thought it was a great metaphor for his life spiraling out of control. And that's what brought me to Comic-Con. Um. Well, my current project now that I'm hopefully finished with, and this body's not big enough for both of us, is um, really nothing. I don't know what comes next. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, how about you tell us about what just came? I know, I, I am bereft of inspiration. Uh, I need help. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, Escaping from Houdini is the third book in the Stalking Jack the Ripper series, and. Um, I guess quite simply, it's a Victorian era CSI or a Gothic Nancy Drew, and it's kind of just like hell on the Titanic. Not that the Titanic wasn't hellish enough, but there's a carnival that's there, and there's bodies that keep showing up. So yeah, it's like the Titanic meets Agatha Christie, and just murder and mayhem and magic kind of combine for fun. For fun. <laughs> it's delightful. It's a happy book. <laughs> Um, my most recent book was Saint of Wolves, which came out uh, in April. It's about uh, a Nazi hiding in Kansas um, who started a church. Um, and uh, right now I'm working on a book about a Secret Service agent who has to choose between uh, stopping an assassination of the president or saving his own son. Go for the son. Uh, <laughs> um, so Breach is my debut novel. comes out in November. Uh, I don't, I like to... Like it when genres mash together, so it's half spy thriller, half fantasy novel, set in uh, a Cold War version of Berlin, where the Berlin Wall, instead of being made out of concrete, it's made out of a magical spell, and that magical spell is starting to fail. Um, so that's what's coming out in November, and what I'm working on now is the sequel to Breach, which will continue the story um, and take on more Cold War adventures, this time in Havana, Cuba. Awesome. So this panel is nominally about uh, how you create tension in both your works and inside the reader themselves. What do you think is the key to a good mystery or thriller or suspense novel? Like, what's the most important aspect when you put yours together? And anyone just jump in. Well, like pacing. we're crafting one ourselves. Yeah. I would say pacing. Um, yeah, I usually, uh, when I revise, I go back through and rearrange chapters to make sure the pacing is on point, which screws me up because then the weather's always wrong and the time of day is always wrong, so the copy editors have fun with me. I like the characters. I think that coming up with morally gray characters is usually kind of what I like to do, where you can see the villain's point of view and kind of almost understand them, even though you don't want to, or like capturing that charisma and, yeah. For me, I, um, I tend to write unreliable narrators, and so I like to keep people guessing on whether or not is this character, is something wrong with them? Do they have a psychological problem? Is this really happening to them? So that's... Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, to piggyback off of what you both said, um, building a, a, a character that's, that kind of takes on a life of their own is a huge part of, I think, making um, a thriller matter to the reader because that's when you can really start layering in what surprises people. Because otherwise people don't really care about the surprises. Um, so I agree that's a huge part of it. And, and I, I'm, I'm a pantser writer, so I, like, I write by the seat of my pants. I don't really outline. Um, so I, I do like to be surprised by the plot as I go. And that way, that's really the only way I can put in twists that seem surprising to the reader. Otherwise, see, that, they'll see it coming like a mile away. That's rare. Like, rarely do you run the suspense, mystery, thriller genre. We're no, usually, like, notorious plotters and outliners. So it's very, very rarely do you hear somebody be like, oh, I just let it go, because I couldn't write a twist to save my life if I hadn't planned it weeks ahead of time. Oh, I mean, that my, that's why my first drafts are completely unreadable. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel very sorry for my editor sometimes. Yeah, as soon as she said that, I started breaking out in cold sweats, the idea of trying to, like, <laughs> start without knowing the ending. Oh, that's terrifying. Yeah, for, for me, on the mystery, the, what I'm hoping for is just that it's satisfying when you realize what actually is happening. Because um, otherwise, just you've spent all this work to build up to this moment where the reader finally has that, oh, and you want it to be oh, and then oh, not oh. <laughs> <laughs> Very well put. Uh, so you guys were talking about characters, and actually one of the most important characters of any book and often overlooked is the villain in your stories. And so how do you guys put together a good villain? Like what makes a villain stand out versus sort of the cookie cutter, like I'm just here to thwart what, my, what the hero is doing? Well, it's, kind of, it's, it's a little trite, but the important one thing to remember is that the villain never sees themselves as a villain. They're always, they're the hero of their own story. And so you could easily flip the story around, tell it from their perspective, and you would understand why they're doing what they're doing. Otherwise, then yeah, you just, you don't have a villain, you have a, you have a cartoon character. Mm -hmm. yeah. I like to make them really likable. That way when they kind of do the bad things, people are like, no. <laughs> I've, I've always enjoyed villains that are talented, you know, the ones that are like good at things, the ones you grudgingly sort of nod at rather than just being annoyed, like, oh, everyone has someone in their life, they're like, man, I hate her, I hate her so much, but she is really good at math, you know, like, so I always find this more interesting when you can sort of respect some aspect of their character, they're like a total jerk, but they're nice to a dog, you know, it changes everything, you know, you just throw that in there. Uh, what is the greatest mystery that you've had to solve in your life this week? I found this room. How to room. navigate you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Finding this Sorry, room? I found this conference room, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's a hard question. That is. I know. I'm trying it to remember the something. beginning of the week. The mystery is like, what happened this week? I don't actually remember. <laughs> <laughs> it's all a blur. I had to figure out how I was, my daughter can't drive yet. So I had to I hired somebody to teach her how to drive this week. So I was like, you have, you have to. That was my biggest thing. I was like, my husband was like, we can teach her. We can teach her. I'm like, no, no. But my biggest problem was actually, what am I going to wear? So I went with the fandom shirt, because I thought that was the way it's to go. It's perfect. Fandom. Yeah, see, this is, this is what I'm delving for, guys. You know, what you, there, there had to have been some dilemma that you faced, and it created tension. It usually is about organizing my life, because I'm not a very like, disorganized person. I think it had something to do with buying plane tickets for my mom's birthday. <laughs> Just figuring out schedules. Like, I'm the worst event planner in the world. so. Um, I'm pretty sure that was a mystery that I was figuring out earlier this week. <laughs> so when you guys label yourselves, which everybody does, because you have to go and put your book in a bookstore, and it has to live somewhere, and then it has to be a marketing plan, and your publisher has to understand it and therefore apply it to your book, do you guys consider yourselves like a mystery a, a writer, a suspense writer, or a thriller writer? Like, is that something you put on yourselves? Like, what would you say you are if you had to classify it in that area? I really kind of hate that my books are, are called mysteries because there's no mystery to them at all. I usually reveal the villain right away. Um, so I, I think I'm a thriller writer or a suspense writer, but they still call them mysteries. I have no control over that. <laughs> Yeah, I think generally I'm, I think of myself as science fiction and fantasy, but I think the, like, the advantage of, of being in YA is that there's not these huge breaks in genre, so all the YA young adult books tend to be kind of all lumped together or like all alphabetized or whatever, and we're not kind of separated out, um, which is kind of nice. So I, I guess I've never really thought about, thought about that. I, I say suspense or thriller. Some people have said contemporary for mine, but it's also a thriller, but usually suspense. Mm -hmm. I'm a Hitchcock fan. I just usually think like dark. <laughs> <laughs> just crayon, just start crayon. Like my own little dark genre, historical. 
So what is your go-to method for building suspense in your work? Like, what do you do when you want to build a scene and you want to get the most tension you can get in it? Is there any sort of tricks of the trade that you know that you employ to, to try to lead your reader one way and then slap them going the other way? I mean, building up like a, it's like what you guys were saying earlier, like building up a character to be so likable and um, hopefully someone that the reader wants to follow and follow and follow and then just tearing their life to pieces in like one chapter. I think that that always builds tension. <laughs> yeah. I think trust. You, if you trust yeah. the character or if you trust the villain and then you they betray that, I mm -hmm. think that that, is, that comes as a gut punch. Mm -hmm. Trust is a big one for me. Yeah, I had a scene in the, the book that I was working on right now, and I wrote the scene, and everybody seemed nice and friendly, and it, it was great. I'm like, oh, what a nice scene. And I'm like, there's, oh, but that's not what I'm supposed to be doing here. And so I sat and I thought, I'm like, okay, what is the worst thing that can happen to this character right now? And once I figured that out, I rewrote the scene, and the scene turned out great. So being very, very mean to your characters is usually a good way to go. That's excellent advice. Microphone, please. Working for me. Is it just Can you hear me? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I just like wreaking havoc on my characters. Like, I think, what is the worst possible thing that could happen right in this moment for them? And then I think, how oh, is there something else a tiny bit worse? And then I do it kind of like in steps where it's like the progression of just <laughs> killing them slowly and darkness. painfully. <laughs> and <laughs> darkness. <of> darkness. <laughs> How do our characters hate us? They just hate us horribly. <laughs> like, you ever get those questions where, like, oh, you know, who, who would your characters want to, like, would they want to have tea with you? And I'm like, no, they wouldn't. No. <laughs> no. Yeah, I think I saw there was a, a hashtag on Twitter last week that was saying the question was, what would your character say to you if they knew if they knew you and realized you were their author? And most of the answers were, I think they'd be really just like punch me in the face. Or, you know, <laughs> Thanks. I'm like, yep, a lot. that's about right. <laughs> right. Yeah, my answer to that was just like, stop killing me. <laughs> I'm pretty sure my character would say that. That would be the first thing, maybe the only thing that needed to be said. It's like, please stop murdering me. <laughs> uh, so what is a secret talent that you possess? We all have them. This is a really weird one, and because I can't do it, I can't actually demonstrate it, but I can hear a voice, like a character voice on TV, and I can mimic it like a little parrot for like three seconds, and then I can never do it again. That is a very. That sounds more like an aneurysm than a talent. I like it. It's a talent. You never know. It's that might talent. be the thing one day. That <laughs> I'm going to want to hear from everybody on this question. <laughs> Apparently, one of the talents is drinking water. <laughs> can, our, can our secret talent be avoiding questions? Yes. <laughs> That's more of a superpower, I would say, than a talent, but I, I will accept it. My cooking, my little nerdy food blog. My little. Tell us a little bit about your food blog. I want to hear a little bit. Of, I mean, that's a that's a rare side thing. You got a whole writing career, and like, oh, by the way, a blog about food. We just blog time. on the side. So I haven't really updated it in a while because kind of deadlines have been killing me. But yeah, I've got kind of food allergies, so I have all this food that I make, and I put it up for other people who might have dairy allergies or something. So other little nerdy people like me can find recipes that hopefully that's nice. <laughs> Does it include murder? <laughs> Anyone else? I have a slightly relevant, but maybe not a completely relevant story. Um, Those so, usually end up the best, so go for it. <laughs> so when I was three, um, I got bitten on my eyelid by a wild rat. And, <laughs> you have to back that up. I don't know that that qualifies as a talent, but we're going to keep going. Um, stretching it. <laughs> well, OK, then. Then I went into a coma for a month. Um, but I'm fine. I'm OK. <laughs> Everything is fine. Um, and came out of it fine. And I just woke up. And I was like, I'm hungry. I want noodles. Um, so I'm waiting for my power to manifest. That's a long coma. We're waiting for the That's a non-insignificant coma so like, length. <laughs> Are you sure you're not a character in a book? <laughs> what was that? And you wanted noodles? Do I have that right? My, according to my uncle, that was the first thing I said when I woke up. I was like, I want a bowl of noodles. <laughs> Edgar? That's it. <laughs> Secret talent? Juggle? Tap dance? <laughs> going unperceived in panels. I like it. Going unperceived in panels. You're going to have to share that mic. All right. So what is the most amusing or embarrassing interaction you've had with a fan over something in your own work? 
and I can answer this while we wait because that's one to think about. I have a fan who's, who's a big fan, and he's in Texas, and he's really into my viral series, which was six books, but the last one I wrote, I think, was four years ago. I don't read books once they're in print because it stresses me out and I want to edit them. So I don't ever go back and read my book once I've turned it in. It's just a thing that exists like this. But people learn your stuff and they know it and they know it really well and then they ask you questions about your own books that you have no idea what the answers are, you know, because I haven't thought about that story in eight years. And so they're like, ah, oh, so he likes to crack inside jokes over the microphone to me when he asks questions about like book two of my viral series that I literally don't know the answers to. I don't know who the characters are that he's talking about. It was a long time ago. So like having to make up like fake like you have read your own book is a weird situation. I, I, yeah. go ahead. No, I go can't ahead. top that, but um, the friends of the main character in my book, he has a car and they call it Bumblebee and from the Transformers. And so I had one, I don't really have fans yet, you guys, because my book just came out in June. So if you want to be my fans, I will, I will take you away from him because he doesn't <laughs> love you as much as I will. And um, so basically the, the car is called Bumblebee. And I had one reader who actually was from the city where I was born, which is Worcester, Massachusetts, which is the weirdest, most central place in Massachusetts. And she loved the Transformers so much, and she had a Transformers tattoo on her leg. And she was so stoked on this that she told me she was going to get a Bumblebee tattoo. And I was like, all right, my job here is done. Yeah, I too don't have many fans yet, and I'm also taking applications, so if you're interested. Um, <laughs> But when my book when my book was announced, uh, it was just a little blurb uh, about the title. I didn't write the the blurb, and it it had a, a slight historical inaccuracy about the purpose of the Berlin Wall in it. And I'm like, that's okay. I'm still just excited. I'm getting a book out there. But I think within two minutes of that going live on Twitter, there was all there were people being very clear about. Are you? That's not what the Berlin Wall is about. Are you, do you know what the Berlin Wall is about? It, and they, this, you know, links and diatribes about that. And so my my agent was ready to like launch and attack this person. I'm like, I'm still too early in my career to start alienating people. So I'll just say, just read the book, and it'll all make sense. Yeah, that's a fact. Like, if you get anything wrong down to the slightest detail in a book, there's some person whose entire life is based on knowing that detail, and they write emails, <laughs> and those emails are nasty. And like, I remember it was a boat, you had, you had to throttle up or throttle down, and I don't know which makes a boat go faster, and I got it wrong, and man, did I get crushed for that. Actually, let's talk about that. What's the most interesting thing or funny thing you've ever had to research when it came to your book? Like, what's the weirdest thing that you were afraid, if anyone else knew you were looking into this, they might think you're on an FBI watch list or you're a monster? Um, what a dead body smells like <laughs> after trauma and before trauma. And if you're wondering, it's a whole canned chicken. So that was I'm sorry, continue. So yeah, if you want to know, I think it's like a day after trauma, it'll smell like a whole canned chicken. And, and then, then a day after? The day after, it gets really worse from there. It gets really putrid and stinky and you know, corpsified. So. so you're concerned that it might smell good? Yeah, you just. Someone ran out. That's <laughs> but then two came in. <laughs> I'm a little worried right now because I'm uh, I'm Googling a lot about Secret Service agents and how many are guarding the president and what their hours are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have, um, uh, there, you know, it's setting in Berlin after the war, so there's some Nazi stuff that comes in there, and I know that um, Alex has some of that in his book too, and I'm just surprised as I Google for it now just how uh, the current news is pushing off all of the historical references stuff off well, my Google search, so I got to dig a little deeper to get stuff on it because it's a little too, a little too current. Yeah, I, for the Young Elite series, I was researching like just common medieval torture, um, so there was, I had a lot of Google searches about that, and I think the weirdest one that I came up with was they would, they would tie you down and make sure you were barefoot uh, and pour salt water on your feet and then put a goat in the room with you so that the goat would lick your feet. And apparently that, that was sounds quite nice. <laughs> she has yeah, I was like, there was not, there was not a lot more description than that. I was, I'm still very curious about the rest of. I just, how that I, works. I imagine someone threatening me with that. I was like, oh yeah, yeah. oh yeah, wet foot. Well, how about the goat comes here and licks your feet? I'd be like, I'm not okay. okay. Edgar, uh, I don't do research, 
So, uh, uh, but I have to uh, Google a lot of words to know how they're spelled because English is my third language. So uh, now I'm remembering that like a year ago, I had to uh, Google how Jess Extender is spelled and Google Ads has not ceased to remind me once. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what is a former job that you had that you were terrible at? Oh, being, being a grocery clerk. I was very bad at it. <laughs> did, you have a, did you have any disasters, like full-blown? I have definitely thrown a lot of turkeys by accident. <laughs> they put me on like Thanksgiving duty, and I, I don't think I was supposed to be on that. So I dropped a lot of turkeys. <laughs> And then they smelled bad? And they did not. <laughs> they smelled like dead bodies. <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, it was working in the dental lab making these, these teeth. I was, I was an art school student. And um, you basically have to take these, these little molds of human teeth and dip them really quickly. And it's like a dark green wax. And there's like a specific like hand, hand move. And I couldn't get it right. I was getting yelled at every day. And then you use the little dental tools and you shape the tooth. I was so... I'm definitely, I'm, too, I'm a 2D artist, I am. <laughs> but just trying to make teeth was, was not fun for me. Um, I worked in marketing in my mid-20s, and uh, th those were very dark times, and I don't recommend that to anyone. <laughs> <laughs> I think that still holds true today. Yeah. I worked at Rocky Mountain Chocolate Factory yeah. um, when I was 19, and it was a kind of a cool experience, except I had to make the apples with the caramel sauce, and I would kind of drop it on different parts of my body, and it would just, my flesh would come off with the caramel sauce. It never got into the food, though. So. <laughs> See, I thought when you started that, that was going to be such a nice story. <laughs> I'm feeling a little hungry. <laughs> flesh removing chocolate job, it got dark. A whole canned chicken and a caramel apple. <laughs> I, uh, I illustrated, I think, three comic books before I figured out I can't draw and uh, <laughs> switched to writing. Uh, I, was a, I was a dishwasher um, and once at a restaurant, which was okay, except for the times that like the chemicals would get on your hands and maybe not as bad as like chocolate, but um, it would kind of like melt all the hair on the back of your hand. Um, but then I liked that job so much when I went into college, I got a job working in the, the dish room of the of the cafeteria, and people in a restaurant, you know, their food is gross, right, because it's, it's food, but they're mostly tidy. College students, when somebody else is paying for their food and they have accesses to unlimited quantities, they get very disgusting and creative. Um, I can't eat mashed potatoes anymore. Uh, they mostly used it as like, uh, well, either modeling cement. I, they had, uh, for the Christmas dinner, there was a, um, a snowman this tall that came up the conveyor belt. Um, but mostly they would just take plates and glue them together with mashed potatoes. And fun fact, you can't get that apart. Doesn't matter how many times you run it through the dishwasher, you just smash the plate. <laughs> Don't tell my boss. I mean, I, he may not have been okay with it. That was the I was bad part. Of it. Man, I can answer this question all day. I, I once was a lot manager at a Volvo Saab dealership, and I took the job because I got extra hours, but it was owned by my girlfriend's father, and then I ran two Volvos into each other and, <laughs> like... <laughs> He showed me the bill, and he was like, this is worth more than your entire summer, and it was awful. Don't work for your girlfriend's father. That's what I learned in high school. <laughs> so what was the most, fun thing that you, the most fun thing that you had about your writing your last, latest book? Like, what was the most interesting part for you that you were like, this is why I want to write this story? Um, for, for Warcross and Wild I, I really enjoyed making my own video game in the book because like, working in, in actual games, like making a game that actually works requires hundreds of people and lots of testing and beta testing and things go wrong forever. Um, and in the book I was like, wow, I can do anything and it will work and it'll be great and I don't have to test it. I can just put it in. Um, so that was really great. And I'm pretty sure some of the game mechanics don't make sense because I've gotten, speaking of readers catching on to your mistakes, I got a lot of those from gamers who are like, this mechanic doesn't actually make any sense. I'm like, too bad. It's in the book. It works in the book. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> so that was fun. Me? Anybody? Anyone? Jump in. Um, for me, it was the, the researching the springboard diving and um, learning more about that. I've always watched that on the Olympics, and I was, I, I, I thought uh, Greg Louganis was a god as a, as a child, as as most people did. And so, um, 
learning all about it. But man, that is a technical, that is such a technical sport, so closely related to gymnastics. And they have some very strange rules. So that was, that was a pretty cool thing to learn about. Um, I actually wrote this book uh, in 2013, I think, and it was in Spanish. And I, I didn't get to publish it there because in Spain nobody likes me. <laughs> so uh, uh, I translated all, all of Spain. I know. Yeah, it's rough. <laughs> I went over. Um, so uh, I translated it to English in 2000, uh, uh, yeah, 16, 17. Uh, my editor here liked it a lot, but uh, we had to change a few scenes, mostly because some of the jokes uh, had already ended up here. And uh, one thing that had happened in between uh, was that uh, the Deadpool movie came out. And I thought that that was a very good source of inspiration for this kind of character. So I watched the, you know, the first scene, the, the highway uh, car chase in Deadpool, the first movie. Mm -hmm. I watched that like 25 times in a row, <laughs> trying to build a scene that kind of fit the same structure. And I got away with it. Now the prologue is the best part of the book, and the rest is all trash. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. You're your best publicist. Do you know that? <laughs> He said he didn't like being in marketing. Yeah, it's, it's, it's well, probably for the best. Time, I told you. <laughs> know thyself. So for escaping from Houdini, obviously Houdini is, plays a part in the book a little bit. And I had to research all of his tricks and try to really figure out the science behind the illusions. And I started learning card tricks from YouTube, people who were amazing. And I was doing like the snap change. And I was like, this is going to be so cool. I've watched like 90 videos, and I do it, and I just like drop the cards all over the place. So it is much more complex than it looks. But yeah, that was really fun to play with cards. And What's a snap change? You hold like one, there's two cards. You hold one on the front, and then you basically, if you're holding the car with your three fingers, you take the middle finger, and you slide the top one through, um, you slap it, and then it looks like it's a different card. It's very yeah. technical, but yeah. We're all going to try it at home. Yeah. <laughs> I got to uh, go on some ride-alongs with the Highway Patrol, but um, and that was really fun. But uh, and you know they showed me how they handcuff people. They have three different ways depending on how violent you are. But uh, the coolest thing was I befriended a coroner whose job it is. He he flies uh, his own plane, his own little plane, and covers four states. He covers all the little towns in four states and. Uh, when, when there's a suspicious death or murder, he goes in and pretty much takes over a funeral home and has his own like mobile equipment that he uses to um, examine the scene uh, with his team um, pretty much all by himself with his plate. So he's just like, he's the coolest guy. So he's gonna take me out uh, in his plane and let me come along on crime scene investigations. So that's gonna be, I haven't done it yet, but it's gonna be really fun, I think. Or gross. I don't know. <laughs> Probably both. Probably both. <laughs> yeah, those are all really good answers. I'm not sure I can really top that. Um, on the research side, I just read a lot of books. Um, so my answer, I guess, would be a little more on the process side. Uh, I wrote the book, and there was just this one, I guess it was a twist, that I just never really liked. And But the rest of the book was OK, and I figured I'll figure it out something eventually. And then I just remember, I think I was, yeah, I was, I, was, I rode the bus to and from work, and I was walking to the bus one day, and I'd finished the book, I'd already kind of sent it out in submission, and suddenly the answer was just so obvious, and that moment was just so satisfying. It was like an itch that I couldn't scratch for, uh, for six months that finally just went away, um, and then it all just came together. Does that happen uh, a lot? Do you, do you get, does everybody else get um, stuck, and then if you just stop thinking about it and do something else, eventually it comes to you? Napping. <laughs> and I have a whiteboard in my shower. Uh, that's not a joke. My wife hates it, but that's when I think of everything, and I need to write it down, and I don't want to go for the phone, because then you're going to get the phone wet. It's a disaster, so you've got to be fast. Um, we're going to take some audience questions, so if any have any, please come to the microphone in the center, and we will do that in a second. And while we wait for people, uh, I, would, I always like to ask this question, because some people have great ones. So what's the worst idea for a book you've ever had? And think about it for a second. I'll give you mine. Um, so there was this, 
uh, emoji that used to be on the old forms of emoji, and it's the little daughter with pigtails, but it never looked right to me. It always looked like a face with two hands right there. So I started <laughs> thinking about this character called Face Hands. And then I, I, I was gonna, I, had, I developed this whole backstory for Face Hands. Face Hands was gonna be like British, I don't know why, and like live in a chimney, and they were gonna multiply, and they'd come down and they would eat people. And like the Face Hands would like, so you'd hear them, they'd be like, hello. And then the Face Hands would like attack, it's like a swarm. And I really got kind of excited about this in like maybe a graphic novel sense, and my agent could not have been more no uh, <laughs> on this idea. And then, to make matters worse, they updated all the emojis, and the girl with the pigtails no longer looks like Face Hands. So Face Hands doesn't even exist anymore. <laughs> and then I was all bummed, and I was like, but oh, dodged a bullet there. And then the emoji movie came out, and I realized I had a movie on my hands, I had no idea. But anyway, it was a bad idea. Or a great idea. <laughs> no, it was bad. <laughs> Speaking of movies. <laughs> Anyone else have one? <laughs> I, had a, I was going to do a, a comic book series. I thought I was going to do a comic book series about um, not just a tooth fairy, but an entire land of fairies where um, if you lose any body part, there's a fairy that takes care of that. So there were... <laughs> yeah. I think that's good. This is, this is the kind of gold we're trying to mine here. <laughs> That's your worst? Really? That's not so bad. It, it, it got pretty gross, really. <laughs> uh, anyone else? My worst idea, apparently, they tell me, actually, I think it's one of the best. <laughs> yeah, and I wrote two chapters, and I showed it to my editor and my agent, and both said, what is this shit? And they, I, they don't want me to continue, but I think I will. <laughs> It involves uh, porn stars who go treasure hunting, but the treasure map <laughs> leads them right to Area 51. And it's a novel, but it's also a musical. <laughs> Amazing. By the way, writing songs is like the most fun you can ever have. Try it. I mean, uh, I, I, now I want to do a musical book just because it's an amazing experience. I love it. Yeah. I want to Rhyming things and, and, and making up beats in your head. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Any other terrible ideas down there? All good ideas? Yeah. All right, sir, go ahead. The zombie book I wanted to do it was zombies and prep schools, and it was just terrible. My agent's like, mm, maybe you should just try something else. Like the zombies were in a prep school. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why. It's, it's a take. <laughs> I'd read that. <laughs> so bad. Is that on? You can just yell it out. Does anybody have an example of an unusual way in which the spark of the idea for a new book came? Hmm. That's a good question. I live around the corner from the Westboro Baptist Church, and <laughs> I have to pass them every time I go to the grocery store. And uh, sometimes walking the dog, I have to walk through their pickets. Uh, lines. I, if you've heard of them, um, good, I guess. Uh, if you haven't, I don't think I want to explain who they are. But uh, that, was, that was kind of the inspiration for my most recent book. Um. I don't think anybody can talk yeah, about that. We all went like, that. whoa. <laughs> Did anyone else in the audience have a question? You can just ask it out or I can ask some more. Feel free. Yeah, right there. The question was, how do you overcome the challenge of being published? Which is an interesting way to phrase it, and I kind of like it. Yeah. I thought I had to think about it for a second. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to go with that. Sometimes I lay on the floor and just turn everything off. <laughs> lay on the floor, turn everything off. That's a strategy. No. <laughs> you mean the challenge of like staying published or the challenge of, like, of the hurdle of getting published? Get a good agent. Find like a, I'm yeah, get on. a good agent. <laughs> yeah, really the agent's the person you got to convince, and then they'll be your best advocate. So then the question is, how do you convince the agent, um, which is hard. Uh, I, I wrote a lot of, of stories and uh, books that I, I thought were great, but um, when I got to the point of talking to the agent, you have to write and very, you have about 300 words, if that, to convince them that your book is interesting and marketable. 
And so my advice that I took upon myself, which led to, to breach, is that I wouldn't start writing a book if I couldn't write those 300 words. Um, I knew before I, before I started writing the story that I knew how to, how to pitch it. So that, and that's what worked for me. And I think perseverance, too. Um, for me, I wrote eight books before I wrote Stalking Jack the Ripper. And I signed with my agent in 2012. And we went out with a couple of projects that we got really, really close with. We got to the end of the line. We were so close to getting them published. They just didn't work out. And I think it's just kind of putting your head down, continuing to write and do your best, and just know that failure is not permanent, and you can just keep pushing through, and one day you're going to get your yes. You just have to keep knocking on those doors. Yeah, I agree with her. I have um, probably 100, over 100 rejections for Dives Back. I put it away and wrote something else. You just, you just keep writing. So did you say 100? Yeah. It's a lot. That's a lot, man. <laughs> That's a lot. I'm very, very, very grateful to be here. Um, so just, you just don't quit. You just write something else and then come back to it. And you have to listen to the feedback, even if you don't like it sometimes. Just keep going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you find that writing YA versus more adult, is there a big difference? Like, can you talk about some of the difference between writing a suspense or a thriller YA versus I don't pay any attention to that. I just uh, write it and then let the marketers decide whether it's YA <laughs> or, or adult. So. And I think, I think that's the best answer. I think if you ever try and write to a market, you're going to write something poor. You sort of have to write the story, and then they'll figure out what kind of market it is. But a young adult novel is only, I've only defined it by two things. It's a per, no, person, character of a certain age is having an experience for the first time. And that's all that a young adult novel is. Um, everything else is is pretty wide open. And I actually think the YA space is like you can write pretty much anything yeah. in young adult. I think it's actually harder to get away with difficult topics in adult literature where it's really, really open in young adult right now. Marie, you can speak to this. Yeah, no, that's absolutely true. Um, I When I first started writing Legend, I didn't actually know it was YA um, until, you know, my agent was the one who told me that it was YA. So that was when I when I realized that I just, I guess I had like a natural voice for it, um, the the plot kind of fit in, like Brendan was saying, YA in general is about people of a certain age um, experiencing things for the first time, and it's very current, like this is happening to them right now. It's not like I'm an adult looking back on my life, which would be adult. Um, it's, no, I am... I am a teenager right now, and this is happening to me right now. Um, so there's like a there's like an, an intensity to YA um, that I mean I've never written adult, so I'm not actually sure what it's like to write adult. But um, that's to me what YA feels like, and and it's like Brendan said, it's it runs the gamut. You can you can get away with almost anything in YA. Yeah. Uh, but Carrie, did your series really going to end at four books? <laughs> um, definitely for now I'm just planning the fourth book um, I think it just feels like it's the natural ending for the series I kind of I didn't want it to drag in any place and it seems like it's the good conclusion for the characters I can't say that we won't see them in any other possible other arenas someday but yeah for this main one it'll be it'll be it yeah. <clears throat> And I think a way to frame that is, you know, are you more like, is it a character that starts a story and then you figure out what they're going to do? Or is it, do you think of a situation and you start to fill in the story? And obviously characters are important both ways, but like, which, where, where do you start? Is it the plot or the character? I think for me, I always start writing just short little character bios. I like to know who they are, what they want, and how I can kind of loosely go in and screw up their plans. And then kind of the plot will come secondary. And then for me, for historical figures that I'm using, I'll kind of research them and get ideas from history from what they did and fill it in. Yeah, but it's definitely usually characters for me to start. Mm -hmm. For me, I start with the situation. I don't have an, a character name. I just, it, it's about a boy or it's about a girl who, and this, 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 and this happens. And then once I have that, I have to know the ending before I start writing. It's like a thing for me. And if I, I, I just, it's like, I need that map of where I'm going. So I am the plotter. Yeah. When you were beginning, did you almost like break down the structure of your favorite writers or any favorite writer and just sort of almost ghostwrite their, like take their skeleton? You know, just to give yourself like a pattern or a, a structure to try and start that way? Or was it more organic than that? You know, just, I'm always struggling with certain pattern and then if I 
Mm-hmm. I no, I think you understand the question because I think we've all grappled with this when you're early. So go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I think I don't think there's a right way to do it. Um, I, it took me a long time to find my process. So this is my first published book, but I'm I'm writing my fifth book right now. And so I like to use a book that's called Save the Cat because it's a screenwriting book, and I think it really breaks down. You you should check it out. It's great, and it br- it really breaks down the beats of the story and the turning points. And um, but it's done you know it's done through the l- through the film lens, but also you just you use it for a novel. But I ha- I do know some people that have done that that have gone and and um, like said, oh, I really like this book, and I'm gonna put sticky notes, and this is where this turning point happened, and this is where you know, this crisis happened, and they follow that and write their own story. It's just, it's just not, it's not the way I do it. Personally. And actually, uh, Jessica Brody, uh, an author, oh, yeah. uh, well-published, is writing a version of Save the Cat for novel writing, uh, specifically that will come out later this year. So just as a plug, if you like that screenplay book, she's actually doing the book to write it, just flip it over to novels, which should be an interesting read. So uh, we're now going to switch. Thank you for the questions. We're now going to switch to the lightning round. So the lightning round is how I like to end every panel because we're going to try and get the energy level up. So it's very simple. I throw two things at you, and you pick one or the other. That's it. But there's also no not answering, and there's no also long-winded <laughs> explanations to the answer. We Short-winded explanations are encouraged. OK, everybody understand? We're going to start with Marie, and you're going to go down the row and answer each one. Ready? All right. Thor's hammer or a Wookiee Patronus? <laughs> Thor's hammer. <laughs> Thor's hammer. I didn't understand the question. <laughs> Fair enough. You, you pick one or the other. Which would you like to have? I didn't understand the words in the question, literally. Third language, I remember you. <laughs> Fair enough. Gary, you, you want to go? Wookiee. The Wookiee yeah. Patronus? Uh, Thor's hammer. Yeah, Thor's hammer. <laughs> the correct answer was Thor's hammer. Um, so would you rather have a robot servant or a talking pet? A uh, robot servant. <laughs> oh, robot servant. Yes, talking yes. pet. Mm. Robot. Robot servant. <laughs> talking pet, so I'm not murdered by it. I just don't think dogs or cats have anything interesting to stay, especially dogs. <laughs> just feed me, feed me. Let's go outside. Let's walk. Hey, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? Feed me. I don't, I don't hear that. All right. Um, would you rather be presidents of clowns across America or a professional clown hunter? Ooh. <laughs> Ah, uh, clown hunter. Clown hunter. <laughs> hunter. 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 Let's kill them all. All right. Uh, prehistoric Earth or the year 3010? Ooh. What did he say? Prehistoric Earth. Prehistoric Earth oh. or 30, the year 30, 3010. I don't know. 3010. What was that middle They part? might be very similar. Prehistoric Earth <laughs> or the year 3010. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And there's no guarantee we're going to get a 3010, so. Prehistoric, I'm going to go. Prehistoric. 3010. Toilets. It's 3010 it's because of the bathroom situation. Uh, <laughs> all right. I don't know what to do with the seashells. Magic wand or, ooh. <laughs> Magic wand or lightsaber? Magic wand. Magic wand. Magic wand. I don't know. I want both. Magic wand. <laughs> lightsaber. Magic wand. It's a lightsaber. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right, and this is, think very carefully on this one. Goonies or Stranger Things? Ooh, nice shirt. Tough car. Right. <laughs> God. <laughs> um, the Goonies, because I want to live. <laughs> Goonies. My first book was called Sleeping with Winona Ryder, so Stranger Things. <laughs> Goonies. Stranger Things. Same reason. <laughs> you too. Do I get thrown off the panel if I haven't seen either one? Oh, oh. sweet boy. Uh. <laughs> and this was going so well. <laughs> I mean, Goonies never die. Come on, guys. All right. Uh, You either have a ghost in your home or seven zombies surrounding your house. Oh, God. Um, Ooh. Oh, this is not a lightning round anymore. Um, Lightning. Lightning, uh, lightning, lightning, lightning. (laughs) Zombies around my house. Ghost. 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 
I can kill zombies. <laughs> Ghost. <laughs> I feel, I feel like the zombies are manageable, yeah. right? You know, like this you is can't... a more practical arrangement. <laughs> All, right. All right, this is this one takes a little thinking, so let's let's focus here. You either sweat cheese <laughs> when you sweat, it's cheese that comes out, or you vomit three marbles on the hour every hour. <laughs> uh, um, what kind of cheese are you sweating? <laughs> It's not like delicious cheese. It's not like cheese. Gouda. Okay. No. Um, it's the kind of cheese you imagine sweating. <laughs> sweat cheese. All right. Uh, I'll do the marbles. Marbles. Yeah, I'll do the marbles. I sweat cheese. <laughs> <laughs> I'll sweat the cheese, too. I knew a guy who sweated cheese. I'd vomit the marbles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, marbles all the way. <laughs> all right. You either have no depth perception or a very tiny mouth like this. <laughs> No depth perception. <laughs> yeah, no depth perception. Tiny mouth. <laughs> depth perception. Uh, depth perception. Yeah, tiny mouth, milkshakes all the time. <laughs> you just drink smoothies, it's fun. Um, <laughs> last one, okay, very quickly, give a book recommendation of something you're reading or you think the audience should read. Mm. An Ember in the Ashes by Soba Tahir. Uh, Berserker by Emmy Laybourne. My Sister, the Serial Killer by Oyinka and Braithwaite comes out in September. That sounds great. Girl at the Grave by Terry Bailey Black, which is out in August. Uh, and Sons by David Gilbert. The Broken Girls by Simone St. James. I'm sorry, the correct answer was Genesis by Brendan Reichs. Uh, <laughs> thank you guys. Everyone give a round of applause to our panel. I appreciate you coming.